in the next month, January or July of 11, 1940, uh, four days before the Democratic Convention met in Chicago to nominate a candidate for president, uh, President Roosevelt had a two-hour conversation in the White House with Justice Felix Frankfurt. <coughs> Excuse me. This was the first conversation known, known to anyone uh, between September of 39 and July of 40 about the subject of whether to run for a third term. And there was no record of that, that meeting, two hour meeting. But at the end, uh, FDR asked Frankfurter to write him a memo immediately on what he had just said. Frankfurter said he would, but he wanted to request one also from Archibald McLeish, who was then the Librarian of Congress. Now just picture this. Here's the President of the United States on the verge of deciding to run for a third term. He's not asking a politician. He's not asking uh, for personal advice. He's asking a Supreme Court justice, who is not a politician, and a poet who happens to be library, library of Congress. Well, to find out exactly what they said, I think that there were memos, and they both, he came back with two memos the next day. Uh, and, and, a, and they're very revealing, and probably the best window in FDR's mind at this point. And uh, I'm not going to tell you what's in them. You got to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in the end, he did decide to run. Uh, he couldn't find another Democrat who would support his domestic policies, his foreign policies, and who, who he thought could win the election. Uh, and so he he basically offered himself to the party. There were a lot of problems with that. It set the stage for a very dramatic convention, uh, too, too too dramatic in some ways. Uh, but this is a story that's filled with, uh, with, we can get into some of this in the question and answer period if you like, but the fascinating characters like Francis Perkins, one of the great underrated, underrecognized uh, people in American history, uh, Charles A. Lindbergh, leader of the, of the isolationist mm -hmm. movement, uh, Wendell Wilkie, the Republican nominee, came from nowhere, but who, uh, who played a remarkable role in supporting Len Lee Sampson after the election. Winston Churchill, you're just getting to know Churchill, they haven't met, they'd only met once in 1918 during World War I at a dinner in London. Churchill never remembered the encounter. <laughs> <laughs> Roosevelt never forgot that he never <laughs> but, but they, but they, But they got along pretty well. Uh, obviously, informed one of the great, great relationships in world history in the 20th century. Uh, matter of fact, they one, one of the things that uh, that Roosevelt did, he he did two things during the during the course of the campaign, which is very hard fought and very tight. He supported the first peacetime draft in American history, narrowly passed the Congress, and he found a way to send destroyers to Great Britain because all, all of their escort vessels were being sunk, sunk by U-boats. And, uh, and he did this uh, without having to go to Congress, which was unprecedented. And uh, that had great ramifications for the country later on. Uh, so they're trying to work out the terms of how this was going to be put to the public. Well, Churchill was deathly afraid that uh, because it, it, Roosevelt could only do this under US law if he did it as a bargain. You know, get something in return, so he got use of British bases in the Caribbean. Well, Churchill, being the good politician that he was, was worried that he might be seen as having a, a lesser of the bargain. So they couldn't, they couldn't get this worked out, so, so uh, FDR arranged a transatlantic call with Churchill and put uh, his Attorney General, Robert Jackson, on the line. And Jackson tried to explain why under the law this had to be a bargain. Churchill said, empires don't bargain. <laughs> and Jackson, to his credit, said, well, republics do. <laughs> Roosevelt jumped in and said, well, you see, Winston, uh, I have this, I have this uh, attorney general, and, and we have, he says we have to bargain. And Churchill said, well, I suggest you trade those destroyers for a new attorney general. <laughs> so they, 
they, they, they got it all done. Uh, anyway, it was a tight election at the end. Uh, it was uh, it was very close. And on election eve, you know, the, the parties, the various parties, would buy radio time. There was no television. They'd buy radio time uh, at, the, at the very end. Uh, and the, uh, the Democrats bought five minutes of radio time for, guess who? Carl Sandberg. There would be yet one more national radio address that evening. This one delivered by Lincoln scholar and poet Carl Sandburg, who admired Roosevelt and saw to it that the president had received his classic multi-volume biography of the 16th president. FDR had studied Lincoln for years, especially since entering the White House. And there was no one who, who, could, allow, who could draw a parallel between the two presidents more persuasively than Sandburg. In a five-minute broadcast, paid for by the Democratic Party. He quoted an Illinois congressman, Owen Lovejoy, on his deathbed in 1864, the year that Lincoln's re-election was very much in doubt. Quote, I am satisfied, Lovejoy said, as the old theologians used to say in reference to the world, that if Lincoln is not the best conceivable president, he is the best possible. And although he does not do everything that you and I would like, the question recurs, whether we could elect a man who could. Now that's a pretty damn good endorsement. <laughs> uh, so, on election night, Roosevelt thought he was going to lose. He was sitting in the dining room of the great house, the big house at Hyde Park, as he always did on election night. And he was looking at some early returns, and he saw something in those early returns that worried him deeply. He thought he was going to lose. He, uh, he asked the Secret Service agent to shut the door and not to let anyone in. And the agent said, you mean not even your family? I said, not anyone. The agent said he'd lost his nerve. Nobody had ever seen FDR lose his nerve. But he broke out in a sweat. Uh, it didn't last because he did, he did, uh, he did win the election, of course. Uh, but Lincoln, too, thought he was going to lose the election in 1864. And not until Sherman took Atlanta did that turn around with, with his re-election really assured. So, so those, those parallels continue. Uh, let me just conclude with another quotation from Roosevelt's third inaugural in March of 1941. It was a, each inauguration since 1789 serves as a time for the American people, quote, to renew their sense of dedication to the United States. In Lincoln's day, the task of the people was to create and weld together a nation. In Lincoln's day, the task of the people was to preserve that nation from disruption from within. This is all FDR's work. Equating the nation's current crisis with those of Washington and Lincoln, and his own task with the two examples, FDR declared, in this day, the task of the people uh, is to save the nation and its institutions from disruption from without. So even at that point, in the third round, he was withdrawing parallels to Abraham. Well, let's stop at that point and take some questions and get a good discussion going here. Thank you very much. I know there's a lot of very knowledgeable Lincoln people here, so you're going to show me. Go ahead. Okay, that's not Lincoln. Did any other president ever consider a third term? Yes, two presidents had tried. Uh, one of them was Ulysses Grant. Uh, he very much enjoyed being president, and his wife, Julia. Yeah. And uh, they, he tried twice and failed both times. Uh, once right after his second term, and, 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 and then he came back in, in 1880. And the other one was Teddy Roosevelt, who's FDR's hero, and a bit of a cousin, right? That they had tried, but no president had succeeded. Thank you. Thank you.
Let, let me just say, uh, before I go on, how much I really admire this series that you put together and, and thank Cal. Where's Cal? She is, she's done a great job. She's downstairs. Downstairs are working. She's down there. Uh, anyway, we're, we're, we're bragging on you, Callie. Nice, nice job. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, for, for what you did and said. That, that, was, that was terrific. Uh, Northern Trust, thank you. Uh, David Bruce Smith, my old friend. Uh, we did some traveling together. We're always talking about presidential history together. David's promised to write a biography of Chester Arthur. Uh, you know, there's a lot of public to mail. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yes, sir. Yeah, who, who were the other men in the uh, Democratic Party that might have run for president? Well, there were only two people that actually did run. Uh, they were James Farley, or not, yeah, James Farley, who was the Democratic chairman uh, of the uh, party and postmaster general, and uh, he thought it was his turn, <laughs> and he, he didn't like he didn't like the idea of a third term for, for Roosevelt. That was all wrapped up in the fact that he thought it was his turn. <laughs> uh, uh, and he actually ran in some of the primaries and got a few delegates, uh, as did John Nance Garner, his vice president, Roosevelt's vice president. That, that had been a marriage of convenience hammered out in 1932 to put Roosevelt over the, over the, over the number he needed to be nominated for that. And they, and they did not get along. They really didn't like each other. So the fact is, and this is something that's really perplexed me, is that there were not other serious candidates uh, who, uh, you know, who supported the New Deal, who were popular, who, who were competent, uh, and who were, who were, as they said in those days, available. Now part of the reason for that is because when FDR would not say what, what he would do, he kind of froze the people. And, 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 and some people who otherwise might have been willing to, to pop their head up and say they were interested, didn't do so because they didn't want to incur the wrath of FDR if he ran. And of course, he did. What was the general commentary in the press and editorials as that issue was germinating? Well, there was a lot of press interest, as you could imagine, and uh, and uh, the press would constantly prod him on this, and and he would always make light of it. He said. For asking that question, I want you to put on a nice cap and go stand in that corner. <laughs> and he got away with it. <laughs> Anybody saying that? Were there editorials that were saying you oh, should, you should not? And what was the? Well, you, you could get you could get any kind of opinion you want. I mean, opinions were all over the lot. But the press started calling him a sphinx because he wouldn't reveal <laughs> he wouldn't reveal the secrets. And in the December. Uh, 1939 Gridiron Dinner right downtown here. Uh, the press mercilessly hammered about this country. And they rolled up and rolled out an eight foot high paper mache sphinx with FDR's face on it, cigarette holder and a giant. <laughs> FDR loved it so much that he bought it and it's now at the FDR library. <laughs> yes, sir. There was a political cartoon published at that time. FDR as Hamlet, and the caption was to be or not to be. <laughs> yes, that's right. Very good. Very good. You're right. Yes.